The word solution refers to a homogeneous mixture. So if you have a mixture of stuff that is not dissolved in water, technically you shouldn't call it a solution. If it's dissolved, you can call it a solution. And a solution can be a mixture of several different things, as long as it's homogeneous. The thing that is present in the greatest amount would be called the solvent, and anything else, any other components would be called solutes. So here's an example to make sure that we understand that. If you just take a small spoonful of sodium chloride, table salt, and put it in a cup of water and mix it, it will dissolve. The solvent, since we have more water than salt, the solvent would be water. The solute would be sodium chloride. And the solution would be the mixture we end up with, the salt water. So a lot of times, especially uh, in the problems in this class, the solution is going to be things dissolved in water. We call this an aqueous solution. We've seen this before in our reactions. We call things AQ. But it doesn't have to be something dissolved in water. Air is a solution of gases dissolved in one main component of gas. We've talked a little bit before about metal alloys. Those are solutions of one metal dissolved inside another while it was molten and then, you know, refrozen. So what determines whether something will dissolve or not? Back in chapter six, we looked at things that were nonpolar and how those tend to have poor or low solubility in water. And that's because to dissolve, to mix together, the intermolecular forces in the mixture have to be stronger than the intermolecular forces either within the solute or within the solvent. So if a solute has strong intermolecular forces, like if, I, if it's ionic or hydrogen bonded or fairly polar, then it's going to take a very good interaction with the solvent to break that apart. So it's going to have to be either a polar or hydrogen bonded solvent to be able to break apart those interactions. All right, let's see if I can illustrate this. Here we have some nonpolar solute attracted to more of itself weakly. So you remember nonpolar things have very weak intermolecular attractions. And then we have water, which is capable of hydrogen bonding, attracted to itself very strongly. In order to have these things dissolve, we have to have an attraction between nonpolar solute and hydrogen bonding water be strong enough to break these other interactions. And it's not good at breaking water-water interactions. Water would rather interact with itself, more water molecules, than it would interact with nonpolar solutes. So nonpolar solutes are not very good at dissolving in water. They dissolve better in nonpolar solvents. So the takeaway thing to remember is that like dissolves like. Polar things dissolve better in polar solvents. Nonpolar things dissolve better in nonpolar solvents. So we have water as our example of the polar solvent. We need something to be a nonpolar solvent, so we've chosen hexane. Hexane is an example of our nonpolar solvent. Hexane is something that is only made of carbon and hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen and carbon have nonpolar bonds, so something that is only a hydrocarbon, only made of carbon and hydrogen, will be nonpolar. So here I have some possible solutes. Maybe pause this and see which thing, which solvent you think the solute will dissolve in. Okay, so hopefully we were able to do that. So cholesterol, any lipids or fats are very nonpolar and they do not dissolve well in water. They dissolve better in nonpolar solvents. Uh, some of our vitamins are called water soluble vitamins versus, you know, fat soluble vitamins would be nonpolar. Water soluble vitamins are polar and so they would dissolve better in water. Oil, again, is a fat and is nonpolar. It does not dissolve very well in water. Things that are ionic, as long as they are soluble, will dissolve better in water. Some of those insoluble compounds we learned about are just because the ions are attracted to each other so strongly that water isn't strong enough to break that apart. 
So that's why we still have some of those ionic compounds that are not soluble in water. But they are definitely not soluble in nonpolar solvents either. So if an ionic compound is going to dissolve at all, it will dissolve in water. Vinegar is a weak acid that is capable of hydrogen bonding. It has an OH group in it, and so it dissolves well in water. So I have a couple of videos on Canvas that show the difference between ionic and covalent bonds, and specifically how ionic compounds, when they dissolve in water, separate into ions. So I recommend you take a look at that animation. It's much better than my drawings. When these ionic compounds are in water, remember we looked at that in our total ionic equations as well. We said that anything that was listed as aqueous, if it was an ionic compound, really when we wrote these total ionic equations to look at what was happening, we wrote them as separate ions. And we listed this for acids as well. So a strong acid, I think we had a problem where we had hydrochloric acid dissolved in water. And since hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, it dissociates completely into hydrogen ions and chloride ions. Since we haven't taken a look at acids and bases yet, I would specify and let you know that a certain compound is a strong acid or a strong base or a weak acid or a weak base. We'll be studying that in the next module. But the thing about weak acids and weak bases is that they mostly stay together as a covalent molecule. Here we have acetic acid is one of the acids that we've learned the formula of. It's also one of the examples in the Canvas video I've linked to. And mostly acetic acid stays together as a molecule when it dissolves. So it just has a tiny amount of ions. Covalent molecules, as a rule, since they are not made of ions, they do not dissociate into ions when they dissolve in water. They stay together as a molecule. So if you have sugar, if you've looked at the structure of solid sugar, you take a spoon of sugar, you can see that it's made of crystals. And those molecules of sugar are all stuck together in a very ordered, nice structure. And when you dissolve that in water, it will break up that structure but each sugar molecule will stay together. So if you had glucose as a possible sugar, each molecule of glucose will stay together, even though the crystal of glucose molecules breaks apart and each molecule floats off separately from the rest of the crystal, the molecules themselves do not become ions. They do not break apart into some positively charged carbon and negatively charged oxygen. Then we have an observation that we can make that probably was noticed before we even knew what electrolytes were, that some aqueous solutions conduct electricity very well, and it's because they have a lot of ions in them, a lot of strong electrolytes dissolved. Some solutions do not conduct electricity. Solutions of sugar have no ions to conduct electricity. And then if you have a weak electrolyte, you can conduct electricity a little bit. I just wanted to briefly mention the concept of equivalence as a way to quantify the amount of charge that can be dissolved in water. So an equivalent is one mole of charge. It can be either positive or negative charge because either positive or negative charges can help carry electricity through an aqueous solution. And I just also wanted to point out that if you have a mole of ions with a plus two charge like magnesium, then you really have twice as much charge as a mole of sodium ions with a plus one. So if you have something with a plus two charge, a mole of it, it's actually gonna have two equivalents of charge because it's twice as strongly charged as a mole of sodium. And then a mole of nitride ions would be triple what a mole of sodium has regarding charge. Okay, so if you have one mole of sodium chloride and you dissolve it in water, then what you really have is one mole of sodium and one mole of chloride. One mole of sodium has one equivalent of charge and one mole of chloride also has one equivalent of charge. So if you have one mole of sodium chloride, you have two equivalents of charge. 
So what if you didn't have one mole of sodium chloride, but you had some different amount, 3.7 moles of sodium chloride? Well, we've just established above that one mole of sodium chloride has two equivalents of charge. So we can use that as a conversion factor. If one mole of sodium chloride has two equivalents of charge, then 3.7 moles of sodium chloride would actually have 7.4 equivalents of charge in it. Since it was helpful up above to know how many equivalents were in one mole of sodium chloride, let's go ahead and do that first before we figure out the 0.84 moles. So one mole of magnesium ions has two equivalents of charge because it's a plus two charge, so it's twice as charged as the sodium. And then two moles of chloride also has two equivalents of charge. Again, twice as much as one mole of chloride if we have two moles of chloride. So altogether we have four equivalents of charge in a mole. So four equivalents is one mole of magnesium chloride. We can use that as our conversion factor. So 0.84 moles of magnesium chloride and four equivalents per mole gets us to 3.4 equivalents of charge in 0.84 moles. So it's less than a mole so it's going to have slightly less than four equivalents. So we have 3.4 equivalents of charge. It's good to keep in mind that solubility isn't an all or nothing thing. We were talking before about how ionic and polar compounds are soluble in water, nonpolar compounds are not soluble in water, but there is a quantity associated with that. Something can be soluble in water up to a point. There can be a maximum amount of solute or there is a maximum amount of solute that can dissolve in a solvent. And usually we say what temperature we're working with because the solubility can change with temperature. If we are full, if the maximum amount is dissolved in there, we call the solution saturated. If it's not the maximum and more can fit in there, we call it unsaturated. And every once in a while we can have a solution with more than the maximum in there. Warm solutions are more able to dissolve solids than cold solutions are. So we can warm something up and get a lot of solute to dissolve in the solvent and then cool it down. And if you cool it down carefully and you don't bump it or get some dust in there or scratch the inside of the beaker, it can stay in solution more than it wants to. There was a video linked on Canvas where a super saturated solution of sodium acetate was being poured and making kind of like a big mountain of sodium acetate uh, as it poured and hit the solid sodium acetate it crystallized out because it was super saturated. Also I have a video link on making rock candy. Sugar dissolves much more in hot water than in cold water so you can have a stick that you put into a solution of a super saturated solution of sugar water and you can get some sugar to crystallize out and make rock candy on a stick or on a string. Alright so here I have some solubilities of potassium nitrate. Potassium nitrate has very different solubilities at different temperatures. So we are being asked at 40 degrees Celsius what kind of solution will we have if we mix 35 grams of potassium nitrate with 100 grams of water. So at 40 degrees Celsius the solubility, the maximum amount that can dissolve is 43 grams of solute per 100 grams of water. So if we are mixing 35 then that's less than the maximum, the maximum being 43 grams so the solution is going to be unsaturated because this is less than the maximum amount that will fit. We can still fit more. We can put a few more grams in there. At 20 degrees, the solubility is 28 grams per 100 grams of water. So if we cool this mixture down and now we're at 20 degrees Celsius, then the maximum here is 28 grams. We have 35 grams in there. So now that 35 grams is greater than the maximum amount that should dissolve. So this would be a super saturated solution. And this is kind of an unstable state. So if 
a little bit of dust fell in there or an extra crystal of potassium nitrate or if you put a stick in there or if you scrape the side of the beaker then you can make the uh, crystals of potassium nitrate start coming out of solution because there shouldn't be that much in there. All right, so we've mentioned that when you have a hot solvent, most of the time your solid solute is going to be more soluble in that hot solvent because in hot solvent, things are moving around more. Anything, anytime something's hot, when the temperature increases, that means that the particles in that substance are moving around really quickly. And if things are dissolved, if solids are dissolved, they can move around more quickly when they're dissolved than when they're stuck as a solid crystal. And so that hot temperature favors being dissolved so that those particles can move around more quickly. For gases, it's kind of the opposite because a gas just in the air in a gaseous state already is moving around really quickly. Gas particles move around really quickly. And when you dissolve them in liquid, you actually trap them. You kind of, they can't move as freely dissolved in a liquid as they can when they're flying off on their own. Dissolved solids can move more freely than solid solids, but dissolved gases move less freely than undissolved gaseous gases. So um, if you heat up a gas, it's going to want to move more quickly and be more free, and it's going to escape and undissolve. It's going to bubble out. So the gases would be less soluble in hot solvents. Another thing that affects the solubility of gases is pressure. Uh, the pressure of a gas is a very important property of a gas. And if you increase the pressure of the gas over the liquid solution, let's say it's an aqueous solution, the gas is going to dissolve more. Something that you might be familiar with that can help you remember this is a bottle of soda. So in the store, a closed bottle of soda, if you've ever felt it, is pretty hard because it's pressurized. So if you squeeze on a bottle of soda in the store, you'll notice that it's pretty hard. There's a high pressure of CO2 gas that is stuck and closed in that closed soda bottle. And when you look at the soda, you don't see bubbles at that point because the CO2 is dissolved in that liquid. When you open the bottle of soda, you release that pressure. So even if you put the cap back on, if you squeeze it, you can tell that it's not under as much pressure as it was before. It's a lower pressure. And of course, if you squeeze an open bottle, then there's not gonna be much resistance to that. And then when the bottle of soda is open, that's when you see all these bubbles of CO2 gas no longer dissolved in the water, the mixture of the soda. So the CO2 was more soluble at these higher pressures. All right, here's just a little review. So which of the following would increase the amount of gas dissolved in a liquid? Well, remember that between increasing and decreasing the temperature, gases dissolve better in cooler liquids. Heating up a liquid will make less gas dissolve. It'll make more solid dissolve, but it'll make less gas dissolve. If we want to increase the amount of gas that's dissolved in the liquid, we would have to decrease the temperature. Then as far as pressure goes, remember the high pressures of gas are when the gas is soluble. When the pressure is low, the gas can escape. So we want a high pressure of gas over 
the liquid to make it dissolve better.